Good morning. My name is Erin Young, and I am the director of the Clay Studio at Starworks in North Carolina. I was asked to give this introduction for our speakers today because they were both residents of our Clay Studio. Owen, and, Owen Lorian and Dighton Abrams are both dedicated artists and principled to their core. And once they met, it sparked a connection that compelled them to combine their mutual interests, which turned into today's talk, Seeking Ethical Craft. Our first speaker is Owen Lorian. Owen's degrees in anthropology, philosophy, and art creates a duality in his work that took me off guard when I first met him. His work often speaks to his curiosity and oxymora because the aesthetics can in an instant turn from devoted to despondent within a piece. Haven't we all had emotional expressions or experiences that have turned on a dime like that? This observation in human emotions pushes the boundaries of functional craft and becomes sculpture for thought. His perspective warns us that we can try to root out the fallacies in the system, only to find the deception to be in our own perceptions of reality. So let's start the merry-go-round <laughs> on the subject of ethical craft and what we're gonna do about it. Let's welcome Owen Lorian. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> this is going to be trouble, this thing. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Yeah, it's going gonna, gonna to hang out. Uh, thank you for coming. I guess we got uh, tape on the way. Thanks. Um, I wrote kind of what I wanted to say mostly because I uh, have a pretty bad way with tangents and I can get pretty lost as I talk. Um, so thank you for being here. The aim of this lecture is to address the, the complex relationship between producers, consumers, and political responsibility, ethics and craft, uh, been embedded within the same discourse for millennia, but as we will discuss, contemporary society has a knack for appropriating and fetishizing even the most fundamental aspects of uh, the human experience. Green button. Green button. Move along here. Uh, Dighton and I have tackled this project in two parts. First, the general uh, theory of ethical craft, as we've kind of discussed. It and as a site of labor, uh, human relationships, and responsibility. This is positioned against the idea that objects can possess and produce human qualities. Anthropomorphism is a powerful function of culture, but in the case of ethics, freedom, and responsibility, it can be contradictory and sometimes unproductive. Uh, the second part, uh, and Dighton will address how artists work within challenging systems of economies and politics. Um, one's methods, practices, and process reveal one's participation in creating just or unjust relationships and uh, space. Ceramics, in particular, creates a host of potential ethical concerns related to environmental stewardship and social justice, which we'll, Dighton will address in uh, the second half. <laughs> ethical craft is a concept which merges the production of objects with the production of personhood. That is, by seeking ethical craft, we are understanding the ecological system that culture, society, space, and objects create together. This position presupposes a particular view of cultural reproduction and personhood which suggests society as its own craft and collective interpretation at the center of this web. Um, just as kind of a note, the images that I've selected kind of just a little bit of visual candy uh, to keep things moving so you don't get too bored with my voice. Um, they, don't, they won't necessarily like, correspond per se. Um, without bogging us down in the history of philosophy and culture, it's worth noting pretty uh, important influences on my own research and work. Uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, Edward Soja, and Jean Baudrillard. 
Uh, of course, platonic concepts of politics, ethics, and craft remain essential for inspiring more pointed conversation about individual responsibility in the arts. If we want to see how culture reveals these systems and expresses the ideas of social consciousness, it remains helpful, helpful to consider the work of artists and craftspeople. The what of craft is important, but topically I'm most interested in the how. How objects are fabricated reveals the economic and sociocultural system uh, we are producing in. Uh, a craft ecology exhibits a variety of beliefs and attitudes felt by our collective consciousness and by understanding the politics and labor of making, we can better understand broader social trends or structures. Philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah notes, quote, the central thing people are up to is the central ethical task. Each of us is making a life. That is the human telos, to make a good life. Appiah's observations reveal the fundamental aspect of seeking oneself across any cultural expression. Ethics projects how persons create themselves through phenomenological encounters with the world. One could say ethics is a way of practicing everyday life, which points directly and fundamentally towards craft. What I hope to make clear is that the framework for ethical craft brings attention to the reality of individual responsibility, process, and studio methods rather than approaching ethics as a product, commodity, formal rational goal, or political agenda. We can take direct warning from the power of both right and left-wing media to shape culture and the collective consciousness. We ought to be concerned when culture, ethics, and identity become the center of an aesthetic project and commodity fetish. What is fashionable is inherently disposable, and for this reason, we hope ethics remains beyond the realm of fashion, trend, or taste, otherwise face a landfill topped with a very morality. In Studio Pottery, 20th century British ceramics, writer Oliver Watson spends a considerable amount of time discussing the role Bernard Leach had in the uh, creation of British ceramic aesthetic, history, and culture. What emerges is a complicated relationship between object production and moral narratives which elucidate the complex relationship between industry, culture, and identity. Watson writes, the pot made by a potter following the criteria of Leach and Hamada carries a message whose importance goes beyond mere looks. When lovingly made in the correct way and with the correct attitudes, it contains, for those who are open to the message, a spiritual and moral dimension. It is, in effect, an ethical pot. Uh, this quote, to me, has all kinds of really complicated and uh, kind of troubling uh, attitudes. And uh, it brings forth a whole array of contradictory and complicated ideologies and notions of art and the craft object. Watson also points towards the wild sentiment sentimentalization of history reflected in the ideology of the elite school. Um, Watson describes the specific economic relationship created by 20th century potters in Britain saying that most survived by providing for urban visitors, selling reminders of the countryside and a natural life for those trapped in the suburbs. With more time, it would be really interesting to talk about uh, how ideas of urbanism and like ruralism are like embedded within craft and kind of the problems involved in that. Um, the Leach School and many other craft movements of the 20th century reveal deep valuation for an ideal origin and a type of theoretical minimalism. Uh, we can quickly see how the Bauhaus, Leach School, minimalism, constructivists, brutalists, etc., draw from a source of moral origins, creating products capitalizing on strong isolationist and sometimes xenophobic politics. What Watson brings to our attention is how ethics specifically was used as an aesthetic tool marketing products to a particular class of individuals. What we're trying to connect with this concept of ethical craft is just how problematic economic fields, especially capitalism, can be for our experience of ethical integrity. Uh, a common thread in the 20th century culture and our contemporary moment 
as described by Watson, can be understood in an attempt to reorganize the world according to narrative fallacies valuing theoretical minimalism and the elegant reduction towards cultural purity as revealed in the arts and crafts. What we find in Watson's account is a complicated history of culture, capitalism, and marketing, all wrapped up in twisted moral narratives. Understanding the political circumstances surrounding the craft movements gives strange context for a contemporary moment of Trumpian theater, exits, and various nationalist agendas. During the first half of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger had an incredible impact on the fields of phenomenology and philosophy, especially with his essay, The Origin of the Work of Art, where he addresses a jug in Van Gogh's shoes. In a similar way, we can relate how pottery is conceived to embody the ideas of ourselves. Um, interestingly enough, Heidegger's cultural orientation has drawn criticism as historians continue to interpret his writing. The life one leads certainly has an impact upon their work, but we must hold the maker responsible, not the object. Leach and his followers view their objects as emanating an ethos in and of themselves. The vessels were understood to possess, create an ethical aura. This worldview is dramatically similar to various hardline political parties seeking to reestablish old wor world orders, doctrines, and myths. What effect does this valuation of the past have on the experience of the present? And who has access to these myths? Who can participate in these histories? These questions point towards an unethical theater being played out by property owners, fashion industries, the media, and political agents lobbying for their own stakes in the market. Culture and identity are mediated through objects, space, architecture, food, and clothing. This we already know. Though not explicitly political, material culture engenders an, eco an ecology of meaning and value as performed in our choices, decisions, and options. Implicit within this system of objects and space are very real political stakes in social capital, resources, and personhood. Ethical craft as a framework for understanding studio practice will always have its own politics. Here, I'm more interested in, uh, I guess, a classical sense of a polis, where our entire lives, being human, is a political act. Um, cultural tectonics shift under the weight of their own pressures, tensions, and conflicts, revealing elemental social concerns which are often then appropriated by the formal political infrastructure. I want to clarify that craft in the ethical sense is not a political art in and of itself. Political art exists as a form of activism, which does not imply or necessitate an ethic. One can seek political gain with or without ethics. Ethics is a process of inquiry, representation, and again, personhood. To be clear, Ethics describes how persons are able to conceive of and achieve the good life. Ethical craft seeks to address the importance of how work is made, the circumstances of production, and craft as a site of labor. So I have, I have some images here kind of playing with uh, a lot of design, form, uh, here architecture kind of all through these uh, kind of political movements and art movements of the early to mid uh, 20th century. Um, so even though like they might not peer related, I think politically and socially there's a lot of these undercurrents which are all connecting them. Um, there are many artists producing exhibitions and works which address social injustices and political narratives, but the aestheticization of moral concepts does not imply ethical relations or process. To be clear, ethical aesthetics implies the representation and simulation of ethical ideas without necessarily producing the real experience of ethics. Writer and artist Betsy Greer published a collection of works and articles addressing a concept of craftivism. Greer's text is an example for how artists 
or theorists consider the political voice of makers. But looking into this, it's more a threat of activism and social justice politics uh, surrounding uh, particular moral imperatives and does not necessarily imply or necessitate any sort of ethos involved in the process of making. Political art occupies a similar space of media and propaganda where makers, writers, or curators can aestheticize any variety of agendas with an array of positive or negative cultural implications. Artist Thomas Hirshhorn expresses disinterest in political art, saying, quote, I am concerned with doing my art politically, end quote. Hirshhorn's attitude echoes the sentiment about the importance of process and ultimately a concern for the ethic of craft in the face of simulcra and copies. Hirshhorn's position reflects the notion that all art is political. The aestheticization of politics would be redundant and merely produce simulcra of political concepts and products. The history of the Leach School raises serious implications to our inquiry of ethical craft by staking a claim on nearly universal concepts of ethos for specific uh, market economies. It's important to inquire how identity and personhood become synonymous with commodities themselves. Can the object be ethical? Quite simply, a pot cannot. Ethics is far too fluid and all too human to be performed by objects. The focus on an ideology of form reveals a deep social fallacy to locate power and responsibility within objects, materiality, and media. This behavior estranges the individual from their own stakes in personhood and cultural reproduction. The ethical pot, as it's referred to, has the capacity to re reproduce an alienating hierarchy where individuals are subservient to systems of capital, space, and ideology. Ethical craft opposes the moralizing of inanimate objects on the premise that ethics, justice, and freedom are specifically contained within hierarchies of human ecology. Uh, locating one's moral imperative within inanimate objects, however, suggests a different hierarchy where persons are subordinate to the material subordinate to commodities and property. This quickly slips into a world of alienation where persons are seeking culture through copies of copies, simulacra, and reproduction. Ethical craft seeks to try to take back responsibility for the worker, the artist, and makers rather than projecting these stakes of freedom and ex ethics onto mere things. So the question I'm asking is whether or not a cup can cup ethically. And if the vessel is too intimate or too close, let's just reference another object, maybe a car, maybe a Subaru to be specific. It's a great ball. Journalist Elizabeth Petra previously addressed how the president and CEO of Subaru, Yasuyuki Yoshinaga, presented Quote, the case for building a brand personality through marketing, end quote. Subaru has been running uh, their ad campaign, committing to the tagline, love, it's what makes a Subaru Subaru, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And Yoshinaga is specifically targeting human relationships so consumers can relate to an inanimate object by way of an orth uh, anthropomorphization of the car. Petra continues, to remain competitive with distinctiveness, Subaru has relied on marketing tactics, tactics to develop a personality for the brand that attracts consumers. Specifically, they have launched a campaign, a campaign around love by offering Subaru buyers a safe, loving lifestyle. Yoshinaga elaborated, Subaru is here because there is love here. So here's a car company imbuing its products with these primordial human qualities of relationships and emotions, um, family, care. The object, we are told, is the emotion. And in order to participate in this moral narrative, we should buy the Subaru, unless live a life without love. Returning to early 20th century England, 
we can begin to parse out the value of language in the context of marketing commodities, ideals, and lifestyle. What we can draw from Oliver Watson's account of British ceramics is how the craft movement is particularly embedded within any sort of ideal occurring in a social moment. For the time of the Leach School, there's the notions of purity, colonialism, theoretical minimalism, and romanticized historical narratives. Anthropomorphism is a legitimate aspect of many cultures, but trying to project ethics onto material and mere objects only diminishes individual responsibility. If we want commodities to be ethic, ethical, then we are essentially putting social justice and individual freedom up for sale. Similar to Hirschhorn, we ought to be less concerned with the life of objects and more with the life of ourselves. If we give more attention towards behaving ethically, then we may have a chance of producing ethically oriented relations. Objects are, of course, implicated in our everyday lives and participate in the production of space, but at the foundation of any phenomenal encounter of the world is the self. Persons are ethical and objects are not. Thank you. So we are aware of how heavy this subject is. Uh, so as a palate cleanser, I found this food for thought. How many surrealists does it take to change a light bulb? Fish. <laughs> so I hope you will join us in thinking outside the box. Uh, our next speaker is Dighton Abrams. Originally from Alaska, Dighton is the access to this dynamic duo. His exposure to unethical oil drilling in his home state, combined with his art degrees, influenced him to use ceramic work to examine and highlight the impact and responsibility we all have to our field. His rhetorical approach to our social obligations, uh, to our industry and environment should inspire us to take the wheel, even if it is a pottery wheel, and to deal with what it means to practice ethically. So let's welcome Dighton. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to frame mine a little bit differently than Owen. Um, and I had a lot of different approaches that I was going to take to this portion of the lecture. Um, but what I wanted to kind of uh, think about whenever I was, we were discussing and tackling ethics. And if you ever want to get into the most grandiose discussions ever, Owen is your man and has <laughs> the most amazing library of philosophy and books. And that's kind of where we. <laughs> got into this. Um, but I wanted to frame my approach a little bit more on a personal level, because when talking about ethics, it's very difficult to take a broad sense, at least as an artist and an artist specifically. Um, so I wanted to be able to talk about what I was most um, attuned with and what I, where my experiences lied. Um, and as Aaron said, I was originally born, or not born in Alaska, I was born in Eugene. My trajectory is very strange and long, so I don't want to bore you. Um, <laughs> but I was, you know, I claim Alaska as my, my home state. Um, and I found uh, ceramics very late in my life, and I, uh, early on I had this uh, uh, sense for the material, um, and most importantly, the sense of the material far <laughs> outliving me after I created it. Um, and that was one of the main draws for it. You know, when I was looking at other mediums, I started off as a printmaker, etc., and having a medium that I knew once I fired it uh, would last for, you know countless eternity um, was kind of a, a great burden, um, both artistically um, and later, as I found out, um, environmentally and ecologically. Um, and that's what I really want to discuss today, how we uh, frame these hierarchy, uh, hierarchies of materials. Um, and I'll show you some relatively controversial slides later for a clay conference. Okay. So one of the very first um, pieces that I show my art appreciation uh, students um, is this, the Venus of Doni Vestinice. And of course, her sister piece, the uh, Venus of uh, Willendorf, is you know, a little bit more famous. But this one's a little bit more special because this is a ceramic object and one of the oldest ceramic objects that we have. 
Um, and I always thought it was fascinating that it is an object that, one, kind of encompasses what it means to be human, um, very literal um, abstraction of human form. This is not a functional object. You cannot eat out of it. You cannot drink out of it, et cetera. And it showcases this uh, longevity of the material while at the same time kind of encompassing uh, uh, humans' desire to create and uh, understand ourselves. Uh, and of course, uh, pottery sherds are another fantastic example that we have um, within anthropology, another uh, interest that I kind of bring into uh, ceramics and what our understanding of the material is. It helps us to understand our past, how we functioned as societies, uh, both very distant and very um, vast gaps of time, but also very relatable. You know, these are things that are made for uh, ceremonies, for food transport, for eating, things that we have very similar approaches to today, but still kind of retaining in some aspects, some cultures, some degree of decoration and understanding of this need to uh, create something that uh, enriches our lives in different ways. Um, and then also the more abstract ideas of beauty as it relates to ceramics. So uh, that beauty is also a very tricky subject to tackle, and I won't get into that. But at the same time, I wanted to showcase these examples of things that showcase the longevity, again, of the material, um, and also how uh, nature was, uh, in its the, the big end nature, was uh, part of this driving force for aesthetic development. Um, it showcased our interest uh, as humans in the natural world and how that is now embedded in these permanent objects that far outlive their makers um, uh, and kind of brings us to uh, today here. Um, so when I was looking at these objects throughout my research through undergraduate and graduate and you know teaching art history uh, intro classes, um, it really kind of made me think about you know what I was making actively in the studio because as an artist, there's a lot of you know struggle to kind of get to a certain level in terms of craft, in terms of concept, um, and understanding what I was making, why I was making it. Um, but most importantly, uh, what I came to was how I was making it. Um, so that made me question: what, where did my values lie? What did I value the most? Um, so there are a number of things that kind of coincide with thinking about a particular material um, or as an artist. Uh, so first off, you know, I was trying to build a career. I had very clear goals of uh, trying to get into higher academia, et cetera, even as an undergraduate. So I knew that a trajectory was clear, but what path would that mean? What means would I take to get there? Um, what was my measure of success? Was I after money? Probably not with seeking pottery, but, um, um, or was I seeking these aesthetic ideals? Was I trying to create something that was accessible and beautiful? Um, or was it something more uh, deep rooted within my own psychology? Was it purely about expression? Um, and what were my uh, ideas uh, about myself? How did those extend out into the further spectrum? Were these things uh, available to be used for social change, for I, concepts that were far outside myself? Um, so that actually brought me to um, how I thought about the outside world in a more physical term, um, and thinking about ecology uh, and environment as it uh, coalesced with landscape. Um, so here's the most broad Google Wikipedia definition of ecology, but it sums it up nicely. Um, so when I discuss uh, ecology, you know, it is a branch of biology, talking about systems of interconnected uh, items and uh, beings uh, in, within a given system and how they relate to their physical surroundings. Um, but it's also, you know, can be used as a, a, a catch-all term for a political movement that deals with uh, environmentalism um, and protecting the environment from pollution, um, and i.e. pollution um, humans, ourselves, protecting it from ourselves. Um, so when I thought about the, these ideas of landscape and uh, how these systems were interconnected, um, I had a very deep connection to 
these ideas. Uh, I grew up again in Alaska. Uh, this is a mountain that's like quite literally out of outside of my window when I was growing up in uh, Anchorage. Um, and there was always this kind of sense of this landscape as being untouched or, um, for lack of a better word, it's problematic, but pure. Uh, but uh, whenever I thought about these uh, time spans within landscape, it was kind of hard to really comprehend. You know, these are mountains that are far outside of the, the scope of human lifespans. These things are kind of uncaring, un movable, unseen items. But at the same time, we do apply a certain degree of anthropomorphism to them. Um, but that uh, eventually brought me to uh, think about it as I you know, teach clay and teach it at its more scientific levels. Where does clay come from? You know, it's built or made over you know, thousands such millions of years from eroded rocks from these mountain scapes. So we're have that kind of connection, and I drew that connection fairly early on. Uh, also growing up in Alaska, always had the looming specter of oil, um, kind of surrounded every uh, aspect of life uh, there. Um, you know, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline being in my backyard, not quite literally, but literally enough. Um, so you have this, you know, kind of disruption of the kind of uh, what seems at first to be an untouched environment um, and the kind of problematic aspects of oil consumption. And oil most definitely takes the kind of center stage when we talk about environmentalism and ecology. Uh, it's very clear when disasters occur uh, with oil. Um, I lived through uh, oil spills, um, the Exxon Valdez spilled while I lived there. Um, there was all the debate of opening Anwar, the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve, for oil drilling. Um, and at one point, a very disgruntled slash, I think, inebriated person uh, on 2001 took a shotgun and blew a hole into the side of the pipeline, very visibly disrupting and uh, you know, altering the environment. Um, which actually kind of called attention to the problematic ideas of the pipeline uh, in itself. Um, but at the same time, this is kind of like a, uh, um, I, I forgot the word I was gonna use for it, but at the same time, it was something that uh, kind of had this negative aspect to it. This pipeline, uh, we kind of anthropomorphize as this kind of uh, harbinger of, of this evil oil that actually you know, infests uh, and gets spilled and disrupts ecosystems very visibly. But at the same time, it was something that I was very much uh, complacent with, as we all are. You know, we got here by some means, um, most likely some form of motorized transport. We choose lices, uh, oil, et cetera. So it made me think about my complacency within uh, those uh, ecologies. Um, and as I, I continued on my career, you know, I finally made it to Penland, and this was kind of my, you know, the view perfectly framed uh, within spruce pine. Um, so we have this very beautiful vista in the middle of the mountains, and then you see this kind of uh, mountain that's just completely disrupted by the mining process here. Here they mine feldspar um, and other kind of materials. Um, and I had to think about what was my connection to clay as a material as I was using it within these clay bodies? Uh, I wasn't actively going out and digging up the clay myself. I was still a little bit disconnected from the material. Um, so while this clay mine isn't specifically just for extracting kaolins and feldspars for creation of uh, artistic pottery or sculpture, you know, these materials are also used in a number of other products, but products that we also use, uh, you know, microchips for computers and cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. So we're still complacent, even though uh, the, the main goals of these are not necessarily to provide us our clay. Um, so I, I had to think about, like, in terms of this as a disruption versus the oil pipeline, um, you have this... Uh, again, this anthropomorphized sense of the landscape. We kind of give these views of the mountains and these scapes as a way to kind of think about them in human terms. You can go back into uh, various mythologies and numerous cultures 
um, and they most often have uh, either a feminine or masculine quality to them. Um, and we kind of think about, uh, or I often thought about, like how this idea of disruption kind of interrupted this untouched quality of the landscape and disrupted what I thought was something that was beautiful. Um, and it also made me think about this kind of disparity between how we talk about uh, oil versus clay, because they're two fairly ubiquitous materials that uh, whether you're a potter or an artist or not, you utilize ceramics every day, and you're probably going to use some form of oil products every single day as well. Um, and I thought about, uh, oftentimes we still kind of, we don't really attribute uh, clay as being uh, a malicious material like we do with oil. There's no direct uh, uh, natural disaster that we can really think of until you do a little bit of research here. Um, this is part of, or this was a disaster that happened in 2015, an iron tailings dam uh, broke in Brazil um, and uh, kind of uh, flooded this entire valley with uh, various ores and clays, disrupting the entire ecology of the river systems, killing a lot of life and disrupting a lot of people's homes. Um, so this one wasn't very as advertised or as... Um, or as ubiquitous as oil spills that we often see, like the BP spill, et cetera. Um, but it's still quite tragic, and it's considered one of the greatest ecological disasters of Brazil, which is quite a large country. Um, so again, I kind of wanted to bring up this real quick uh, competition between uh, plastics and ceramics, something that, of course, is a little bit uh, controversial, I'll see. But, um, so when I thought about, again, these hierarchies between these materials, they're both something that is created over millions of years. You know, clay comes down from the mountains, it's slaked down, it becomes uh, its, you know, material after a very long geologic time, something that we can't really comprehend except through numbers, et cetera. Um, and the same with the beginnings of oil, you know, we have something that is formed naturally deep in the earth over millions of years, um, and it's also a finite resource. Uh, we don't have the ability to actively go out and create clay out of thin air. We don't have the ability to create oil out of thin air. Um, so I had to think about, too, once these materials are extracted from the earth, often disrupting either the environment or the ecologies or ecosystems, um, we then convert them into something that again, far outlasts uh, their makers. Um, in the case of plastics, the, we don't know exactly how long the thermoplastics will last, but um, we do know that clay does last. But I want to kind of bring this uh, defense a little bit of plastic, but not really. Um, <laughs> so when we're thinking about these two uh, very ubiquitous materials and these ubiquitous objects, so the, the plastic bottle and the, the ceramic mug, they perform the same functions, right? You know, they transport water, they bring it to our mouths, they we allow us to consume, consume it, um, and they're both uh, inert in that they don't have uh, any, uh, if they're made right, they don't have any negative toxic effects when we transport that water. But of course, if we were to replace all of the water bottles in our vending machines, uh, all the single-use plastic with ceramics, you know, would tumble out of there and you know, shatter, et cetera. Of course, that's wouldn't, there's plenty of engineering that you could do to offset that, but you know, plastics don't shatter, so that's one of the benefits of it, and that's why we use it quite a bit, and it is convenient, and uh, you know, I'm displaying my own hypocrisy right here. <laughs> All right, so here we have a, a clear winner on that. <laughs> that's the last time you'll ever see that. All right. So um, another aspect of these finalized products uh, and ideas of them as this uh, catastrophe, these ecological catastrophes, and we see it quite often if you uh, are perusing Facebook quite readily, you see these uh, videos all the time, or at least I do, of uh, you know, uh, various sea life and marine animals being disrupted by plastics and uh, being further aware of like these large plastic islands that we're generating that are floating on top 
of both the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, I actually took these pictures um, uh, recently in Hawaii, and this is a very common sight to see both small bits of plastic and large piles of plastic just washing uh, uh, among the shore. So again, disrupting these ideas of these kind of romantic landscapes, but at the same time, kind of highlighting uh, something that's both negative about this material, but something that I realized I was also complacent in. So, come on now. So in this case, uh, I had to give the win to ceramics here, because ceramics don't flow. So, another point for, <laughs> yes, it's much more agreeable, I see. All right, um, so I, I thought about that in terms of these materials being, you know, considered inert. You know, uh, ceramics don't have that quality that we can visibly see the disruption of landscape and ecosystems whenever they are post-firing. They kind of turn back into these small minerals uh, if they are shards. They are therefore, you know, not disruptive. But I had to think about the processes to get there. Um, another thing I thought about, too, was, again, these ideas of the longevity of the materials. Now, plastics as we know them today, with thermal plastics, et cetera, are a fairly new invention, um, 70 years or so. You know, so when we think of the, uh, the plastics that are negative and float, et cetera, they are uh, very, very young. Uh, and whenever we think about how long, there's all this conjecture on how long they will last, you know, the thousand years, 500 years, et cetera, depends on the type of plastic, but we don't know for certain, not saying that they won't, but at the same time, we don't know as certain as we do with uh, ceramics. Um, but there are other instances. I know rubber is not necessarily a plastic, but it has similar properties. Um, and the Olmec people, um, and Olmec actually means uh, rubber people, which is a fun note I brought to my art appreciation class. Um, there are rubber balls that exist. There are these combinations of natural materials that create a kind of plasticine-ish substance that do, in fact, last for thousands of years. So there is a little bit of impetus that we do know that they will both outlive their makers. So here I have to end it a little bit on a draw for the both of them, um, which again is probably controversial. But um, it really did make me think about Again, how did we get to the point where we were making these materials? What was my, uh, what was my, um, my responsibility in creating these? You know, was I, what is going to happen to this once uh, it becomes a future historical object and it outlives me? You know, is it, does it matter what it looks like or does it matter what the process was? Um, but I had to think much more closely about the process because I was very directly implicating myself in this complacency. Um, so again, growing up in Alaska, uh, you know, I did you know, visit glaciers quite a bit, and I lived there off and on throughout my life. Um, and I remember going to see the Columbia Glacier um, not too far from Anchorage and seeing it as a kid, and it was very massive and it was grandiose and it was big. Um, and I couldn't really tell if that was just because I was really small and everything looked big to me at the time, but I remember going back, you know, 15 years later as a young adult teenager and it being much smaller, I'm like, man, I really thought this was much further along in the valley. Um, this is before I was kind of aware of, of uh, the, the rapid melt of the Arctic ice caps. Um, but uh, one of the, the great artists that really kind of I thought brought like a wonderful aesthetic development to it was James Baylog um, and his extreme ice survey uh, project where he uh, placed uh, cameras with glaciers um, and photographed them over a series of years showcasing like very visibly along these same seasons how much they were receding due to uh, human influenced uh, climate change. So I really, you know, was really deeply impacted by uh, this uh, thing, or this this movement, um, because I was I felt connected to that landscape. You know, it was part of my identity growing up. Um, but at the same time, it was something that was far outside myself. And now I live in the deep south, um, so I have an even larger disconnect between myself and this uh, these concepts. Um, so when I was looking at uh, artists, especially ceramic artists, who were potentially working in the same vein, one of the first that came up uh, was Paula Winokur, and I was very 
saddened to hear of her recent passing, um, and I really wished to talk to her before um, she passed, but I did not get that chance. Um, but she utilized ceramics in a way that uh, both uh, accentuated the beauty of nature. She did some trips to Iceland and Greenland and Alaska and saw these you know, very sublime, very surreal uh, icebergs um, and uh, glacial shelves, um, and really utilized the, the material of porcelain to bring an aesthetic relation to uh, that ice, that sea ice. Um, and I, you know, I want to give her a look, a little quick quote of hers real quick before I move on to the next slide, but um, I thought it was quite nice and summed up what her work was about. Um, After all, when I look at the hills, I wonder what's under it all. I don't mean just the rocks, but the inside, the core, the center of the earth that keeps us all together. Um, and that really kind of highlights this kind of idea of these shared ecologies through landscape, because there are certain aspects of boundaries that we create, but at the same time, um, more and more information really kind of drives home the fact that uh, through uh, capitalism and and various economies, we have this spread of um, our influence through uh, greenhouse gases um, and these feedback loops through climate change. Uh, another artist that I, wanted, I looked at uh, extensively was uh, Dylan J. Beck, and he uses uh, a really wonderful assortment of uh, materials, and he talks about there's not this connection, or there's not this hierarchy between materials or methods, and he uses them in a very uh, identifiable, uh, conceptual way, and it's something that I started to utilize within my own work. Um, actually, before I saw his, not saying that I'm not copying him, but... Um, so when I, I brought some of this research together within my work uh, through my master's thesis exhibitions, uh, I, I came across the philosopher Glenn Albrecht. Um, and uh, he is both a philosopher and a linguist um, and kind of cr- uh, creates or facilitates the creation of these new words um, that kind of help to us to explain slash identify um, some of these emotional problems uh, that extend from uh, our current uh, complacency within destroying the environment around us. Um, and the one that I, I, I found most uh, suitable was uh, the word solastalgia, the combination of both solace and nostalgia. Now, nostalgia is kind of a, a weird word because it was originally kind of meant to describe an actual illness, um, these ideas of pain when looking backwards and trying to understand our memories. Um, and the idea of solastalgia kind of brings uh, this concept, but something, uh, to sum it up, it's the homesickness you feel when you're still at home, or this sense of loss for something that isn't yet lost completely. Um, so I had to think about that within my own work. I, I was still very dedicated to the material of ceramics. Um, and I wanted to make something that was both conceptually sound um, but at the same time, understand my own hypocrisy when I'm creating something with this material. Um, so to offset my costs of, or my environmental costs, I had to think about what, where did my materials come from, how was I creating them, um, and how did they all come together, and were they saying something that was worthwhile um, of outliving myself? Now, of course, I realized that once something is out into the open, no matter what, even now, you can have the longest artist statement in the world, but it doesn't necessarily facilitate your exact ideals with that piece, um, let alone what will happen in you know, a millennia when the future archaeologists uncover it. Um, but with this piece, uh, I, uh, at my residency at Starworks uh, in North Carolina, um, I felt like this really wonderful connection to the material itself. Um, there was no longer this disconnect. I was working in porcelain beforehand, and the Grolog comes uh, across a, a shipping container from uh, mines in England, um, so I had no connection to the material. At Starworks, uh, uh, I was, my studio was right next to the clay factory, and Takaro Shibata um, is a really excellent fundamental resource when uh, talking about uh, creation of clay. And all the clay comes from local materials, local mines, so there was I would drive to the studio and I would actually be near where those clays were taken from. 
So I was much more connected to the material itself, and I also experimented with single firing works um, without this kind of extended bisque uh, um, that kind of utilized more uh, uh, unrenewable resources. Um, but I had to think about, too, as an educator now, how do I kind of impart this importance of creation um, and thinking about materials without overwhelming my students and making them uh, super depressed and not want to make anything. Um, but I was really, uh, I'm at Winthrop now filling in for Jim O'Connell, um, and one of the students there, um, Cameron Carter, is uh, really interested in these local materials and is really energetic about it, and it actually makes me quite optimistic for the future. Um, he does have the luxury of being able to dig up clay on his own land. You know, clay is not always the most accessible, and land is not always the most accessible either. But at the same time, he does have this interest in these uh, aspects of materials. Um, and he also has like one of the best Instagram handles here. So. Um, <laughs> um, but I really had to think about, uh, again, like these ethical implications of myself uh, creating something that was uh, irreversible um, and utilizing processes that were also consuming materials in a very uh, unsustainable way. And I can still not entirely justify ceramics as a sustainable material. Um, but I don't think there really is any material that you really can. It's all about offsetting costs in some way or another. So I had to think about uh, different frames of living. Um, so there are things that I do in my life outside of ceramics that help to offset the cost and help me um, on an emotional level kind of understand uh, my complacency and not overwhelm myself. So I don't have, uh, there are plenty of sustainable options within ceramics, but none of them are going to be the catch-all um, perfect bullet to kind of take care of everything. Um, but I did want to kind of leave with this real quick. Um, and I just really wanted to kind of like, you know, drive home what uh, Owen was, was talking about, that um, whenever we, uh, the very act of living is political. So there's a bit of redundancy when we say things like pottery is political. But at the same time, we are in a, an age where there is a little bit more of an impetus to really think about these things in a much more, um, uh, rapid way. You know, this is not an issue that is going to go away and it's not something that is going to be uh, accent or accelerating in a slow rate either. Um, we have this kind of uh, ratio that kind of keeps expanding. Um, so I just wanted you to remind everyone uh, that any act of making requires material. Um, and materials are actually intrinsically loaded uh, historically, culturally, um, but now more than ever, we have the idea of how they're connected uh, ecologically. Um, so yeah, thank you. All right, um, we only have about seven minutes until 11.30 hits, but the next talk is not in here until um, an hour later, not that we're going to be in here for another hour taking questions, but um, I do want to open it up for uh, people that uh, have any questions either directed at Owen or I, um, and we really want, do want to kind of facilitate discussion uh, regarding uh, ethics and material. Um, so if you do have a question, please stand up to the, the mic right there in the center um, and ask away. Don't be bashful. Well, I, I was just, I'm Naomi Falk. I'm at University of South Carolina. Hi, everyone. Um, I was just thinking about what you all were, t were talking about, and, and when I talk to students about material use and things, and how do you, how do you talk to them about the clunkers? You know, and, <laughs> and, and you know, when, when do you actually fire things, or when do you, like, how, how do you talk to them about that? Because I see a lot of clunkers off and on. Yeah. And then, you know, just what you're yeah. saying. I think that's, that's actually a really great question, and I think about that quite a bit. Um, and that's really tricky because that kind of extends into a different realm. Um, because sometimes it's 
is it is it an aesthetic judgment or is it something that is uh, you know for the benefit of others? You don't want to blow up their work. Um, you want them to understand a better sense of craft. Um, so I do kind of think about that, but I'm still too much of a a, a, um, a wimp sometimes when it comes to that. I don't want to just throw out all of the the work. Um, I do want students to be engaged in ceramics. I do think it is a material that uh, has a lot of benefit um, outside of thinking about it um, ecologically um, for our kind of like well-being, thinking about it in terms of its history, what it can mean for uh, things psychologically. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I do think about that quite a bit. I do think about uh, candling kilns, uh, the energy I'm using to kind of facilitate student work uh, to make it dry so I don't have any tears in the studio? <laughs> trying not to, <laughs> guys. Um, I, I try yeah. to I try to catch clunkers before they're dry. Yeah, and it's a part of the conversation about when they're making it and talking to them about whether or not it's doing what it should be doing, and is the piece piecing is is the pot potting, <laughs> um, because it's a matter of what are they trying to achieve and have they achieved it yet? Because recognizing those failures, um, not so much as failures, but as like steps in the learning process and uh, not to be just so sentimental. And I think also just with ceramics, it's like, you know, you gotta have that callous soul a little bit. You know, things break all the time and uh, things happen in the studio. So kind of like getting students used to like thing, the idea that their pieces might not survive one part of the process or the other you know, getting him hardened up a little bit. Hello, my name is Nathan. I just wanted to add on that. I, I, I use the term uh, self-edit yeah. yeah. because then it's more of a, that piece doesn't suck. It's just, <laughs> it's time to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I was thinking about, oh, and your quote about Leach and like Watson, oh, was it Watson? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, apart having an imbued ethical presence or whatever, and then thinking about data and your, all the materials, like, do you think there's a, uh, like, if you're using processed materials from a strip mine or whatever, uh, you think there's a difference between that and going into your garden and digging some clay and making a slip from some clay from your river, whatever, you know. Those two objects, do you see a ethical difference between them? Um, I think there is a bit of a, a difference between those material choices. Um, and I do think a lot of ethics, when we think about it now, a lot of times comes down to our choices and what we value. Um, but in terms of like the differences between strip mine and, you know, digging out of your garden, um, there are different um, ethical quandaries within there. One is kind of access versus not having access. You know, the strip mine brings in greater access to those materials to a broader spectrum of people. And then having the ability to dig it out of a local area is very kind of uh, a privilege that only a certain people, a number of people will have based on location or, you know, property ownership, et cetera. Um, but in terms of like the materials themselves, I think about it in terms of how uh, is that material transported? What is my disconnect between there? And I do place some value on knowing where my material came from, but I know at the same time that does not solve all of those problems. So there are those similarities, there are quandaries between the two choices. Um, so I can't say that either one, you know, is completely better than the other, but one is a little bit better for me personally, and that's where my values lie. Yeah, I think uh, there's certain ways that, uh, especially like the using of your own uh, materials and sourcing your own, uh, you know, your stuff. And uh, it, it can be uh, s sometimes there's an efficiency to it and there's a maybe an economics to it. Um, but it does get tricky when uh, uh, kind of prescribing these uh, very value-oriented ideas to um, because not as I think what struck me is the the idea of access. Not everyone has access, and if uh, not everyone has access to a pure 
object, then how does that parse out, you know, geographically, socially, culturally? Um, you know, we look at that when we it's, think about content, education, who has access to certain kinds of education, um, you know, where are people living, you know, where do the state taxes go? Um, so it's kind of, it gets pretty sticky when trying to prescribe uh, value to just pure material because a carrot is a carrot, uh, feldspar is feldspar. Um, and if you're buying from a certain source of feldspar or kaolin, then there are people working in those mines who rely on those jobs. So if everyone boycotts a certain uh, feldspar or what have you because of mining practices, then there's people out of work. So it's, I mean, that's, it's, you know, that's kind of an hi extreme hypothetical, but it's just kind of like speaking to the, um, how things are so connected and things get pretty uh, sticky. But again, uh, yeah, the valuation of just raw material can be um, problematic. And that's actually something I, I, I failed to address, but I think about quite a bit. And like in terms of scale, you know, there is quite a bit of difference. You know, in, in the contrast between you know plastics and ceramics, there is a bit of a scale difference. I mean, ceramics are still quite, you know, ubiquitous. I mean, my my favorite slide to show students is like, have you guys used clay today? And they're like, I don't think so. I didn't use a mug. I'm like, you know, I show them the slide of a toilet, and you know, I'm like, you probably did use it. <laughs> um, and you're also in a brick building, but. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but that, that idea of scale, you know, we think of ourselves as a kind of like minority force, like as uh, we don't necessarily have like a large say in those bigger, broader spectrums of like mining and, and material usage because they do exist and we are kind of like a blip on their radar. Um, but at the same time, I do, you know, still think about that as, as a burden, as a small voice. I still have to kind of think about that you know, what is my material choice? Even though I'm like not necessarily, you know, their main customer, um, I still am contributing into it. But the idea of, uh, you know, I have not, I, I just bought some porcelain, so I'm still, I've kind of gone back a little bit on, on what I was doing with some of the stoneware, but I actually will go back to that anyway. Um, but those ideas of, of, of how our scale comes into, into practice and, um, and understanding my complacency in it while not letting it overwhelm me, I guess. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Zona, and I do wanna thank you for bringing these uh, very controversial subjects up. And I found <clears throat> that when I was in my studies of a graduate school, that I came upon some of these uh, problems or issues in my own making. I was predominantly wanting to work at a larger scale, I wanted to mine my own materials, and I began working um, or having an assistant who was a Native American who taught me the ways in which his people mined and uh, crafted the clay out of the earth in their, in their rituals of respect when they did dig their own materials. And I found that to be very beneficial in helping me feel a little bit more at peace with my practice. Um, although, because I was working at a larger scale, I came upon the fact that I would go to a site that was a beautiful mountain, uh, in a sense, and I would dig my materials, and I would return six months later, and visually I could see my footprint, and that began to bother me because 
I was like, well, it's really beautiful to go out and give this offering to Mother Earth, thank her for providing this material for me to be a creative individual. But in the end, I still saw visually this mark in the land. And so I really began to question my practice in working with clay and in our culture, we have an extreme amount of waste. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, like a larger city and, and gone to a thrift store or something like that. Uh, and I, after three years of predominantly working large scale, making things out of clay, my entire thesis ended up being all from recycled materials, which I then processed and like wove. I, I worked predominantly in wool and it was like this kind of peaceful moment for me. And, and then I question, well, is that still ceramic art? Uh, you know, I have a degree in ceramic art. My thesis ended up being all in wool and woven objects. Um, I guess it's just a form of art. But I do want to thank you for bringing this subject yeah, up and uh, thought that I could share my experience with that as well. Yeah, that was great. Thank that you. As well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I do, and, and on top of that too, I do think there's like this kind of um, um, impetus like to having that connection to material and understanding and kind of respecting where it comes from. So you have that very visual yeah. uh, association with it and, yeah. you know, it kind of highlights that disconnect. Yeah. Right. And then you went back and you saw this beautiful mountain before and then all of a sudden you saw like, right where you dug this dark hole, you know, right. and it's like, it's just a great mountain. It's now being affected by this transformation. Right. Okay. Hi, I'm Jessica and I'm from upstate New York. So I'm curious about um, if you thought about options or system solutions for becoming responsible for the objects that we've already made that maybe won't we want to, you know, things that we throw away don't go away. So I'm thinking like, what do we do with the pots that we've made that we no longer want? Or in a class setting of the collection of all these objects that now are, have, serve their purpose in terms of education, but what do we do with them now? Do we crush them and bury them? Do we upcycle them? Um, yeah. Do we need to start thinking about <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I, did, I did see that, I did systems. like that. But I think on a, on a broader scale, I definitely think about that too, because I have, you know, through the education process, right, you start off with like, you know, some clunkers, you know, you're gonna have some pretty bad pots. Yeah, yeah, ashtrays. Yeah, they're they're pretty bad. And you know, I go back to my parents' house when they have my collection, the the horrible <laughs> Dighton Museum. Um, but at the same time, I, I've I've thought about that quandary too, and and I've uh, I've seen a couple solutions that I thought were you know okay. Um, but one of the ones I thought about the most that actually worked was you know, so these pots are maybe no longer valuable to you. They provided the education that you needed to get to that point. Um, they're a stepping stone. Um, and that information is kind of, it's solidified, literally, you know, yeah, it's embedded. It's um, but, you know, maybe it, then that pot is actually more valuable for someone else's education. So helping that, you know, pot to kind of help someone else understand, like, the learning process of it. Um, whether you're, that means, like, you know, education in the, the higher education sense or, you know, K-12 or whatever, that's one thing. But at the same time, you can also, there's ways of, you know, like, donating pots, you know, you know, you know, the, the lame common saying is one man's trash is another man's treasure. But um, I do think that applies, you know, in terms of having like a handmade object, you know, whether, you know, I still value it or you still value it for yourself, you know, maybe someone else will value it and that will actually maybe help educate them on the material and this connection to handmade things. So that's not a catch-all solution, of course. Um, I have a hard time still smashing pots, and I often let them kind of linger uh, in my studio for good to ill. You know, they kind of leer over me. I'm like, that's just awful. Look at that foot. It's really terrible. Um, but at the same time, it's still, I still use it for that education purpose, and then somebody eventually likes it. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk today. It's been been really great. Um, I thought I'd weigh in. I thought I'd introduce myself. My name's Kat. I actually work at the Leech Pottery in St. Ives now, which is still going, which is pretty cool. Um, so I found it really interesting to hear your comments on, on the subject. Um, I thought I also would say that we actually still use 
quite local clay for our production, which I think is really quite central to the work that we do now. So our clay comes from St. Agnes, which is just up the coast, which is also just about the same clay that Bernard Leach was using in his time. And we as a team find it really central to us as makers to be as, to live as ethically as we can and to be making work that while we know is gonna last a, a good long time, is gonna be important for people to use and to want to hang on to and want to pass on for other people. And, and in that small way, maybe we're offsetting some of the impact that we're having on the earth. And we're also really, really strict with our training. So, you know, our apprentices before, um, while they're learning, they make hundreds of mugs before we start actually firing them through and keeping them. And it's, it's a huge mountain of reclaim that, that we go through all the time. So, you know, on the, on the other side of it, I guess, I guess what I'm just saying is that on the other side of it, even on the larger scale production, you know, I think as long as you're keeping a consciousness about it, you know, there's still ways to, to offset your impact. And, you know, we can only try and do the best we can. That's, that is like such a good question, and uh, I've also I've been working in. Uh, well, hold on. Did everyone hear that? We had no idea. Okay, okay. Okay. The sorry. So in the back, the the question uh, really gets to the uh, the use of uh, like marketing around uh, pottery and craft objects getting to be uh, quote unquote local and uh, using natural quote unquote ingredients, and how does that affect uh, kind of the market around that, and who has access to uh, these what become really like expensive uh, products and they're not uh, things that anybody can just walk into a store and buy um, It's like the class especially like talking about you know thrift stores and things Yeah, you can walk into a thrift store and get a mug for 50 cents um, That's a mug that works just fine. That's a damn good mug um, So talking to talking about as makers, how do we address the fact that our products are just so in, uh, like, uh, inaccessible and unattainable for a majority of the population? Um, and I don't know, that's a really hard question. And I guess my, my, my thought is I've been uh, working in restaurants since I was 15 as a cook. And in my early 20s, I was working in uh, a few restaurants and we were you know, all local, all organic, you know, these sustainable little restaurants. And you go in there and you get a half roast, chi roast chicken and it costs you $60 for one you know, dinner, one half roast chicken. Um, and that was, I mean, to me, I was, it was great to work with the product. The product is so nice, um, but how kind of inaccessible and what is the ethic involved in all that? And I feel it's like a really uh, similar parallel between the way the politics of around food have been going for the past 50 years and now more recently with uh, you know arts and crafts, maybe for the past like 30, and specifically in the past like five years maybe where certain terms from like, but you look at, to me it's like all about marketing. You know, the way food has been marketed, you know, it's branding, it's establishing businesses. And uh, that's what, you know, artists do. They have to establish themselves in the world. And um, it's really complicated. I, I don't know about how to, because it's like, the, the field we already operate in is already kind of, um, there's an elitism involved in it. Like, end of the day, no matter what we do, when we're starting out in the arts, we're already kind of um, situating ourselves in a certain way, especially if we get so lucky to live a life in the arts um, as a like professional uh, kind of quality. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, uh, yeah. it is complicated. Yeah, and on, on that too, I think that's why uh, Owen and I connected a little bit more because we both, you know, worked in kitchens for a lot longer. 
uh, a long time. And there is that direct connection between, you know, food and ceramics for sure, but also how we think about those materials um, and definitely access. You know, I worked in fine dining for quite a long time, and I knew that I was just making, you know, food for people that were much more well-off than I was. Um, and it was frustrating, but at the same time, and for me, I mean, I guess, Owen, it's rewarding for you, just like the act of creation in yeah. food. But it wasn't rewarding for me because, I, you know, I didn't have a connection to these people at all and stuff like that. Um, it was just a means to an end, and that's what kind of drove me to, to ceramics. Um, and I do recognize, you know, a lot of my privilege um, within this field, um, and I, you know, still try to kind of make the, the pieces more accessible. I have to think about that in terms of my concept, which can sometimes, when I make work, can be very abstract, but I'm trying to convey a message that is a little bit more uh, broad in terms of how the demographic will uh, be accepted, um, but also understanding that you know how we price you know fun, uh, functional objects can be exclusionary to you know certain people. Um, you know I I've priced a cup that I painted like at sixty bucks, and that is something that I can't still even afford. I can't afford my own work, but it does sell, and I do understand that I have to still live and feed myself, et cetera. But I do think about how that can be exclusionary to other people as well. And, you know, I would, you know, I grew up fairly poor and I would never have thought in a million years that a cup could even be priced at 60, let alone $120, you know. Um, so the, I definitely think about that all the time, but I don't know that I have uh, a solution that I've, I've come up with either. It's very tough, but it's something that's always on my mind. Yeah, price, I mean, pricing is, is, is tricky when you think about it in the kind of microcosm of our profession. But at the same time, I do, you know, I try to think about it outside of that. You know, there, where there's a lot of people out there that, that I want to, for them to appreciate it. But at the same time, it's, I have to eat. So I think, I think we'll do one more quick question, yeah. and then uh, we'll wrap it up. And we'll be around all day. Yeah. You can tomorrow. stop us and talk to us. We don't. I'm um, pretty open. Yeah. So. Yeah. Qu a quick answer would be uh, would be great, um, and then I'll I'll find you later. I was curious about the application of uh, your critique of the ethical object to a um, gift culture or non commodity object. Oh yeah, I great mean, great question. That's actually um, that's that's great because I that's that's something that I kind of help to kind of offset those those implications of access because I give away my pots all the time more than I probably should you know in terms of my own finances but it makes me you know having that access to a handmade object and educating the person on that I think that that if that's what you're getting at I think that that does certainly helps in that aspect and I yeah. don't have a, such a, a I have a connection to my work obviously but at the same time I don't have a, a pretense surrounding it that um, I I care who is appreciating it. I want everyone to do it, um, appreciate it. So that's kind of like how I do that or think about that. Yeah, I think there's a also a difference when you're, if you're talking about gift cultures, there's gift cultures and then there's gifts within a commodity culture, which those are two incredibly different things. Um, and, and in our contemporary moment, you know, it would be pretty difficult to find a gift culture um, in that sense, maybe that you meant it. Um, because gifts within a commodity culture, they have a certain value, um, which then you're thinking about consciously or unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you really for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you.